But by challenging centuries of scholarship, this new form of people power has ignited a huge argument. I despise Wikipedia. I loathe Wikipedia. Uh, I'm appalled by Wikipedia. I use it throughout the day. I think that the web, what, its greatest miracle is of convenience, but the price they pay for being so, so speedy and available is in, in accuracy. I challenge anybody to find a better, faster source of perfectly acceptable knowledge for almost all purposes that you would require as a normal citizen. Wikipedia is a prime example of how the web seems to empower each and every one of us. It offers something for free, it undercuts authority, and it enables ordinary people to shape knowledge together. In other words, it fulfills the leveling dreams of the web's founding fathers. To understand how the web gave rise to Wikipedia, we have to understand the web's roots in a culture of free will and self-expression that can be traced back 40 years. There's something happening here. What it is ain't exactly clear. The leveling ambitions of the online world can be traced back to the counterculture of the 1960s. And the epicenter of this hippie idealism? San Francisco. I think it's time we stop. Children, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going No one really knows what's happening in San Francisco, but this is where it's at. Traditional home of the way out, today mecca of happy hippies who are cracking the smooth silhouette of America's materialism with that ultimate weapon, with love. You better stop, hey, what's that sound? Everybody look what's Amidst the ferment, a particular strand of a philosophy known as libertarianism began to take root. It was a mix of both left and right-wing ideas and rejected state control, the legal system, and censorship, while emphasizing the importance of individual free will. And while the countercultural dream would fade away in the real world, in the 1970s it found an unlikely place where these ideas would flourish. Previously, computers had been the preserve of governments, the military, and large corporations. But now, for the first time, smaller, cheaper models began to put the technology in the hands of the people. And something remarkable happened. This countercultural libertarianism found a new home on what was the early internet. The most concrete legacy of the counterculture is the internet. The values, the organization, the rebellion, the resistance to authority were all encapsulated in the internet. Cheaper computers allowed the first online communities to develop. The longest surviving and also the most influential was called the well. Over in the corner there, that actually is the well right now. It was set up in 1985 near, where else? San Francisco. And without the well, Facebook, Twitter, MySpace, and all the other web communities may never have existed. A lot of people see the well as kind of a place where they live and exist in a, in a, in a not really intellectual, but in an information kind of sense. I met uh, a member of the Grateful Dead on the well. But there's a certain percentage of people in the well who are what I would call intelligent misfits who've made it work for ourselves. It was the well that took libertarianism online. No one was more influential in driving this extraordinary transition than the man who founded it. Stuart Brand once published the counterculture's Bible, the Whole Earth Catalog. He took part in a legal study of LSD and hung out with the Black Panthers. This is where the well began, and what went on here has helped define the entire online world. At the time, a fraction of 1% of the planet had encountered the internet. The well gave many people their first taste of cyberspace. What was it like? I mean, there must have been such a sense at that time that you wanted to change things, that you wanted to revolutionize communication, knowledge, community, the whole shebang. 
I think the assumption we were working on was that the revolution was in progress. We didn't have to push it. And mostly what was drawing us was a sense of both curiosity, what happens if you poke this, try that, think of the other thing. But part of what we were doing was basically making a scene. And uh, so you just had this overlap of people who weren't rich yet, weren't powerful yet, but knew how much juice they had and what a huge opportunity space was opening up in front of us. Usually I check in news first to see what kinds of interesting things are happening, and then I go to wherever there's a controversy brewing. And if it's lunchtime at the office and I don't feel like going out, I'll log into the well and go into the pets conference and talk about my cats. If I've had a particularly stressful day, I go to the weird conference, which is where everybody lets it all hang out. <laughs> there was three or four different flavors of sex conferences. Um, from pretty hardcore to a very gentle. <laughs> there was the True Confessions Conference where nobody said a bad thing to anybody else, no matter what they did and that they were fessing up to. Many people credit The Well with infusing the early online world with an anything-goes attitude, and it did. But for me, what really stepped up the challenge to the established order was when one particular well member took this attitude and developed it into a radical constitution for online freedom. This would be a key moment in creating the web that we know today. Cyberspace had found a prophet. John Perry Barlow, the lyricist of cult 60s group The Grateful Dead. He took the vague libertarian ideas espoused by many on the well and started to give them real shape. And he also caused the well's membership to rocket when news leaked out that by joining the well, you could chat online with a member of the Grateful Dead, fans of the band rushed to join. Deadheads had been online since the very early days of the internet. What they spent most of their time doing was arguing with one another about our deficiencies. <laughs> Uh, the internet. Yeah, right, you know. <laughs> Barlow came to believe that the internet was a challenge to traditional authority, and by setting information free, it would help set us all free. You know, you don't have to control people much if you can control what they believe, and you can control what they believe if you control what they have access to. If you can control what they can know, the rest of it is a very simple matter. Barlow helped start the influential Electronic Frontier Foundation that campaigns for freedom online. It's based on beliefs he distilled in his Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace. Governments of the industrial world, you weary giants of flesh and steel, I come from cyberspace, the new home of mind. On behalf of the future, I ask you of the past to leave us alone. You are not welcome among us. You have no sovereignty where we gather. It wasn't so much as let the people go. It was a statement saying, hey, we're already gone, dude. You know, <laughs> you're, you're going to have a hell of a time trying to catch us. <laughs> Your legal concepts of property, expression, movement, and context do not apply to us. We will create a civilization of the mind in cyberspace. May it be more humane and fair than the world your governments have made before. Barlow's manifesto argues that self-expression should have no limits, and he believes that this free flow of information would confront authority. Today, the world of blogging online diaries and opinionated takes on the news shows that the revolution in freedom of expression can just as easily revert to mindless trivia. But some of the world's estimated 130 million blogs are stimulating a new and important kind of global conversation. The web uh, allows people to express themselves, receive ideas, discuss them with others, reflect on them, and then come up with what seemed to them better ideas. And that's a very exciting and revolutionary prospect. And used in the right way, the web can fundamentally alter 